Uh, today's event is brought to you by Zerto, Druva, and Unitrends. Uh, before I introduce today's expert panelists, just a few items here of note. Uh, first off, uh, this was a super popular topic. We had tons of registrations and tons of questions, and we want this to be a really educational event. So we've taken the questions that came in, uh, organized them, tried to prioritize them, uh, find some common themes, and we'll be asking the best questions on today's event. But we also wanna take questions live during the event. So as your questions come in, uh, I'll be trying to monitor the questions queue. I might be looking over here a little bit to see the questions periodically, uh, but we'll try to interject those live questions as they come in. So feel free to use the questions box there in GoToWebinar to get those questions in uh, during the live event as you think of things. Uh, now's the best time you know, to get all your disaster recovery questions answered. Um, another thing of note, we have a number of handouts from each of our presenters. Those are available for download there in the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, each presenter has provided a resource. I encourage you to check those out, download those, and uh, read them after the event. And then finally, we'll be handing out three Amazon $500 or uh, Amazon $100 gift cards at the end of the event today. So make sure that you stay tuned for that drawing. Uh, prize terms and conditions can be found at events.actualtechmedia.com. And without further ado, I want to introduce you to today's presenters. First off, we have Mr. Heisbert Janssen Van Dorn, Director of Technical Marketing at Zerto. Uh, Heisbert, thanks for being on the event today. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thanks for having me. And I'm excited to introduce Mr. W. Curtis Preston, Chief Evangelist at Druva. Curtis, thanks for being here. Happy to be here. <laughs> and finally, Mr. Adam Margett, Technical Specialist at Unitrans. Adam, thanks for joining us. David, good afternoon. Always a pleasure. And uh, hello to everyone that came in to, uh, to join us today. Awesome. Awesome. Um, all right. Looks like we're good here. Video looks good. Uh, slides look good. So uh, it's great to have you all on today. I know we've done this before. Uh, at one point in the past, I've, I've talked to one each one of you at, at some point. Uh, I know I've been impressed with your experience. Um, and we're going to really show off that experience today through a, a ton of uh, technical uh, questions that we received from the audience. So before we do that, I want to do just a, a couple minutes here of stage setting. I mean, I was an IT manager uh, for many years. We went through a, a year-long disaster recovery planning session, and we tried to do it on a shoestring budget. And I know from that experience, uh, disaster recovery uh, is very hard. And obviously from the volume of questions that we got and the interest in this event, it's it's still hard uh, for a lot of companies out there. And I could tell that by you know sifting through all the questions. Um, I mean, we have so many different scenarios to to deal with. You know, there's simple scenarios like, well, the whole data center is gone. You know, now what are we gonna do? But then there's just different, you know, kind of piecemeal scenarios like, well, the cooling went out or the power's out or uh, this rack, you know, switch failed or, um, specific scenarios and you have to plan for all these different things it's not just a total disaster scenario so there's a lot to plan for uh, then there's also so much complexity in the environment i mean today's applications are more distributed than ever before uh, end users are accessing applications with their own devices they have local data they have data in the clouds they have SaaS applications uh, and if we plan for disaster we have to you know, understand all this complexity and, and how to plan for uh, any one of those different, you know, failure points. And unfortunately, there's still so few funds available uh, is what I hear from, you know, people asking questions about this event. You know, how do we do this at, at a low budget? Uh, or if, uh, if we were to start with just a single thing uh, in our data center, a single D DR solution, you know, what do you recommend? Obviously, they don't have the funds to fully protect everything. Uh, and then questions about how do we justify this to upper management? Uh, it's unfortunate, I think, that upper management in, in many cases still hasn't you know, bought into the idea that, hey, we need a disaster recovery system. And then there's just constant change, as we know. you know, New applications being brought up every day, applications uh, being moved to SaaS or cloud providers. And then also that feeling that you're just never really done. Um, as soon as you implement disaster recovery, you put a plan in place, oh, well, there's more changes that came along, 
during that planning process. And you know now we have new things to plan for. And then companies are afraid to test it. I know a lot of times, I mean, you have this DR plan, you spend a lot of money, but e, I don't know, I'm afraid to test that um, because I'm afraid of what, you know, if it's really gonna work. And then the business thinks that DR is an IT problem. Well, that's just something for, for IT to deal with. We really don't wanna be involved in that. But what I'm hearing from more and more companies like Zorto and, and Druva and Unitrends is that it doesn't have to be so complicated and it doesn't have to be so expensive. And that's why I'm excited to have you all on the event today to share your experiences with real customers and tell us about you know, your latest innovations. And I believe that through new technology, software, cloud, things like that, uh, products such as yours can help a lot of these companies out there who are still struggling, obviously, with disaster recovery. So let's go ahead and just jump into the questions here. Um, the first one, and I've broken these down into really four different sections, best practices, uh, cloud, uh, costs, and there was one other one. Um, oh, ransomware, ransomware. So let's just start with the first question here. And many of these in best practices are kind of high level introductory type questions, because I know this is supposed to be a, uh, you know, kind of getting started or disaster recovery 101 type topic. Uh, and that question is, how do you start a plan? Uh, Adam, why don't you kick it off? Absolutely. So I think that from, a, from an infrastructure perspective, you're going to start working with the individual business units and identify and classify uh, what systems we are protecting, what is their priority, what's mission critical versus business critical versus business operations. Understand with these units, what's your tolerance for data loss on each, essentially a recovery point objective, and how quickly must they be back up and running, a recovery time objective. I, when we're working with our, our sales development folks here and training them, I would say that you know, as, a, as a sales organization primarily, uh, the phones to us are absolutely mission critical. Those need to be back up and running as quickly as possible. The, the server that generates the call stat reports, significantly less important. But you mentioned it too, David, you know, understanding how do we respond to various downtime events. I think a lot of the headline grabbing incidents, hurricanes, fire, flood, ransomware, those more significant events would, would uh, have folks thinking, you know, how do we recover uh, applications, the entire site, but do we also have the ability to respond to human error, software error, and do we have the tools in place whether we need to recover granularly, restore the guests and the applications themselves, or again, means to fail over and protect uh, larger workloads or the entire site? Yeah, you make a great point. Human error is, <laughs> I've heard, one of the most common uh, causes of a disaster. Um, Curtis, what's your take on this? Well, I, I agree with everything Adam said. I would add, uh, and I, I think it was assumed in his RPO comment, but I just want to specifically point out the way you get to an RPO, uh, an RTO, is you you need to associate a cost of downtime to each application, uh, and and then that's because at the end, if you if you just ask them what their RPO and RTO is, the answer always will be zero and zero. So you have to. Um, uh, you have to associate a cost with that downtime and with uh, a certain amount of loss of data. And then once you do that, then you can uh, associate that with a, a particular recovery level for each application. Yeah, you make a great point. So you have to try to understand the cost of downtime and that's gonna help the business to decide how much they're willing to invest in different levels of DR protection. Is that right? Right. Okay. And Heisberg, what about you? So, I mean, uh, all great points uh, and, and completely agree. I think what it really starts with as well is, is getting the right sponsorship from within the organization. Because before you can, can even decide RPO, decide to put a value against those applications, you need to know who owns them uh, from a business perspective um, and, and get the right people and talk to the right people to really understand what the value is, and and sometimes they don't even know. So there's th that makes it really complex. But it is the core um, for starting on a DR plan. Yeah, that's a great point. Get get buy-in from the executives that hey, you know, we're willing to support you and willing to invest some money. You know, hopefully in this project you're you're about to undertake for the good of the company. Um, 
let's see, next question here. How often do you test backups and how often do you test uh, DR? Uh, Heisbert, back, back to you. As, as often as you can. <laughs> um, uh, one of the one of the things when when you do tests, and and that's something I've learned uh, in in the past, is every time you test your DR, test your ability to recover, you learn something new. Uh, I always say, if there's no lessons learned after a test, then probably the test has failed. Um, and so so that's why when you're doing a test and, and you want to do it as often as possible, you, you always learn things about how the environment responds, uh, the changes that have happened that you might not even are aware of. Um, so, so whenever you are looking for a solution, make sure that it's a solution that allows you to really easily test these things and, and maybe even automate it. Uh, I think automated DR testing is definitely something we see a lot of organizations do more and more um, and, and combine them with, with monitoring tools that they have for the production environments and use those in DR environments as well because, hey, they're already monitoring the availability of their applications. Why not use that in a DR test as well and get the same reporting, the same alerts, and, and the same information about the, the health of your applications? Yeah, yeah, I like that. So you test as much as you can. I mean, Curtis, when it comes to testing, can you test... How, how far can you test? Can you test the applications and all the way down to test transactions? Well, I, I think you need to be able to test functionality of end-to-end uh, -end functionality of an app, right? Because one of the things I've always talked about is that when we talk about RTO, remember that you haven't achieved your objective until the application, you know, the entire application stack is up and running. You can't say, well, the, I restored the data, so I'm done, right? If the application isn't doing its job, then you you haven't done that. And I, I do uh, think, I do agree with the idea of automated testing because it's really the only way that you're ever gonna do this on a very regular basis. I know when I was in charge of a backups of a data center that it was such a painful process to do a GR test that we only did it once a year. Uh, and every test I ever did failed and not, not in the nice way that was just discussed, but but in the way in, in the way we defined, you know, and the uh, and, and so you, you have to do it frequently. But the only way you're going to do that is through an automated uh, fashion. OK, OK, good advice. Um, Adam, what about you? How often do you test DR? I would I would absolutely agree um, as frequently as possible, whether that's part of a, a regular cycle, maybe a monthly or a quarterly test. But I think that, that Heisbert mentioned um, something that was really important and that was change. The whole goal of taking backups is with the goal of recovery in mind. And when you look at some of the dependencies on applications or changes to that production environment, if an application is changing significantly through a patch or an update or an OS change, or you're importing data to an application from an external source, um, with those significant changes, I think you should be testing in those regular intervals as well to, to really guarantee and have that proof of smooth recovery. Yeah, that's a great point. And I mean, in IT, things are constantly changing. So I, I guess you need to constantly <laughs> change or uh, update your, your DR plan and, and frequent, very frequently test. Um, one of the things I'm curious about is I would guess that there's multiple, you know, levels, obviously, of testing. I mean, we can test DR automatically, you know, bring up our, our servers and test the applications, but a company also uh, is going to need to test it with employees and you know different scales of disaster recovery uh, testing. Um, Curtis, have you seen that? Is that real world? Well, I, it's real world. I think it's definitely hard. You know, the the more the better your test is, the, the more difficult it is going to be to do. So I I would say definitely. You doing the automated uh, data and application recovery as frequently as you can. As soon as you start involving user testing, or you know, you're going to complicate the thing, and, and I, I cannot disagree that that is a good idea to do, just that you're not gonna be able to do that as often as you could do an automated DR test, right? That's something right. that may do a little less often because you, you, you know, it's the kind of thing you have to do at a time when you're not impacting uh, production, right? Okay, okay. Um, yeah, so um, Morgan is asking, how about personal and staff changes and training? 
uh, is it okay to test DR quarterly uh, in that scenario? Uh, Heisbert, what do you think? But, well, unfortunately, I have to answer with it depends. Uh, it, it depends on things like also regulation, because you, you might be um, forced to test every month by a certain regulation or policy in place. Um, but if you, and I think that's one of the key things about simplifying and, and making sure you can simplify and are simplifying your DR is that um, transferring knowledge, training new employees, training new staff members is a lot easier. Um, the, the, the more complex it is, the harder it is to, to retrain people and, and learn them how it works. So, so I think that's why consolidation of tools and, and simplifying not only DR, but like the whole of IT, I think it's a trend everywhere, is, is key, especially in the dynamic of, of IT and, and staffing. Yeah, uh, I, let me jump in there. Uh, there there's something that, that I, I mentioned about my earlier DR tests and how that they always failed, there, there, but there's a lesson there. And the reason why they failed was that our standard was that the person in charge of the DR system plan was not allowed to actually conduct the disaster recovery, right? So basically I had to stand to the side and what was tested in the disaster was essentially that I was dead and that someone who didn't understand the DR uh, could follow the documentation, could follow the plan and do it. And if you, if you adopt that method, uh, I think you can also, uh, regardless of the frequency of your test, it can also help you deal with those uh, those staff changes that the uh, the person was asking about. Yeah, that's a great way to test it. Make sure that anybody can do it, uh, including the mailroom. The mailroom clerk can you know restore the systems. Um, lots of good questions coming in. We got a lot of good questions here to ask as well. So I guess let's move on. We'll try to get to some of these questions too. Um, another question here, what replication strategy should we use in a DR plan? Uh, Adam, you wanna start with this? So I think our, absolutely. Um, our, our forefathers in backup and recovery recommended three, two, one. I think here at Unitrends, we would almost recommend a, a four, two, two. You wanna have four copies of that data. Um, for example, that could be the production environment, backup copies that are retained locally on site, and then you should be archiving maybe to removable media or an air-gapped copy that's taken off site and potentially to a, a secondary location or a cloud environment that would serve as the warm recovery site. I realize that easier said than done, I think, in a lot of cases, but I think that um, as far as best practices, that is what we would, would probably recommend. Okay. And we got a lot of good questions coming in about um, you know, there's people are struggling to get approvals for testing. Uh, they're struggling to test large integrated applications like SAP that involve, you know, uh, SaaS and and cloud and um, multiple uh, departments and groups. And uh, so th the struggles the struggles are real. Um, Curtis, what about uh, replication strategy? What's your take on that? Uh, so I, you know, I, I also answer that it depends, right? Uh, because the replication strategy is going to depend on the requirements that you've established for the disaster recovery, right? So if you, uh, it just depends on how you know what your requirements are going to be in terms of how quickly you have to recover, and more specifically, uh, how much data you're allowed to lose. Right? So that's going to determine how often you're going to send back to another location. Um, and uh, there, there was well, the question that you said that you said that they were asking. Uh, it was about oh about the, the testing thing. The key, I think, to, to the testing aspect and getting approval for testing is to do testing in a sandbox type way, so that you. I think like when we did our DR test. We shut down the whole data center. We pretended the data center was dead, and then we brought it back up in, a, in an ultimate location. If you do DR testing in a sandbox type environment, you can rec you can rec recover the entire environment and test that that recovery worked without impacting production. And I think that's why a lot of people don't are, are not able to get their uh, DR test approved is that they're going to impact uh, production. Yeah, I would guess they must not have a very solid DR solution or they must not be very confident in it. Um, 
like you said, if they're fearful, it's it's going to bring down production and impact the end users or even the you know the customers in many cases. That's a scary scenario. Um, right. Yeah, uh, Heisber, uh, what about uh, replication? It, it, should it be the same replication strategy for all applications, or do you vary replication based on the type of application? So I mean, replications are bread and butter. So um, um, I, I love replication. Uh, I think replication is is absolutely key, especially in in achieving the uh, uh, the, the RPOs and plus RTOs that people are expecting right now. The the problem with using multiple or different replication methods is that it mostly requires different technology, adds more complexity, different layers of orchestration, maybe automation on top of it, and the the question is um how does it cope with um, maybe not disruptions but but um, um issues within replication so for example if i'm taking a periodic approach i use snapshots to do it every four hours so i'm saying my sla is six hours because i want to make sure it's uh, it's, it's within those those four hours and something happens technology-wise, and all of a sudden, I, I need to skip one job. It's eight hours. I'm not hitting my SLA anymore. So what I, what what my, um, and I think what we, the feedback we get from most customers is, we use the replication method that gets us the lowest RPO, so we can handle those scenarios where we're running out of SLA, and we're using it for all of our applications just because it makes it easier. Plus, it allows us to do um, consistent recovery. Everything goes back to the same point in time, also removing a lot of complexity in, in uh, recovering application stacks that, as you said before, are becoming more and more distributed and complex. Okay, okay, I like that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, ideally it would be, be great to use the same replication strategy, I would think, for all applications, just so you, you have consistent expectations uh, and standardization across every application. Um, but that's that's just my guess. Um, moving on, uh, best practices. How do we know if it will scale? I mean, I think it's great to start small. A lot of companies do that. And then over time, their data grows, um, their expectations grow, their the criticality of their applications uh, grows. Um, Adam, how do we know if our disaster recovery solution will will meet the needs or the scale of our our business? I think that that I would almost look at that as, as workloads are are changing. In a lot of cases, we're not as um, as tied to the traditional data center. And when you look, start looking at integration with cloud platforms or SaaS applications, um, do we have the right solution that will integrate with those pieces, or do we potentially? invite uh, additional complexity by needing to add in additional tools um, to be able to do so from a from a scaling a, a local perspective i think that in a lot of cases here at unitrends when we're going into sizing um, and it's not a perfect exercise but typically we're looking at you know traditional growth rates what do we expect over the next three to five years and also you know where are those workloads going to be existing are you planning on migrating from exchange on-prem for example to office 365 do you have the right tools in, in mind? Or are you looking at the right tools to ensure data protection uh, as workloads are, are moving locations? I think you want to consider where you are today and certainly what those requirements look like, but also where we, may we be investing and what may change with our data center or our environment uh, potentially down the road, whether that's a year, three, or five years uh, from now. OK, OK. And Curtis, what's your take? Yeah, I, I love this question as much as uh, High Spirit Lug, the replication question. So, you know, our our architecture is built on the cloud, and so it can scale as need be, right? So that that's one thing, is to look at the architecture of the product and make sure that, your, um, the, that it will scale as you need it, right? So not all products are architected in a way that you can simply add additional um, uh, capacity to your system and they automatically scale and then just look at how how it scales uh, and what you're going to need to do to do that and then but my very short answer to this question is uh, test right so uh, we, you know we've already talked about testing but the only way you're going to know is if it will scale is, is to test it as you know as your environment grows yeah that's that's a great point I mean and I've 
it, we'll talk about ransomware, I guess, here in just a little bit. But I mean, that's the greatest challenge I've heard uh, in ransomware scenarios is just not being able to recover your data as quickly as you need to uh, recover all of your data. Um, and I guess that has to do with scalability as well. Um, Heisbert, what's your take over at Zerto? How do you know if it will scale to you, to the, need, the needs of your business? But I, I think uh, Curtis hit a great point. It's it's a look at the architecture. Um, does it contain single points of congestion? Does it? How does it? What are the components that process the data? Where does it need to be stored? Is it using scale like cloud? Is it scaling out with your environment? Is it scaling down with your environment? Especially in cloud, that's really important. Um, so um, a, a lot of my answers will be, will be the same that Curtis has, has given already. But I, I think th that's the first step. And then uh, as soon as you're confident enough, test it. That's, that's, that's the only way to know it. And test it at scale. Um, I think anyone out there can protect 25 servers. Um, no issues there. But if we're hitting scale, we're talking about thousands. You, you might not have to test thousands, but try and test it at scale and try and test it with um, production grade um, data. Um, don't, don't take those test machines you have lying around that are only a couple of gigabytes. Make, you, make sure you use production data. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, in the old, um, I'm gonna date myself, in the old round reel tape days, <laughs> that I used to do backups on, um, we would just bring back one random tape and restore one tape. And if the one tape worked, then they were probably all good. You know, uh, <laughs> it wasn't much of a test, but you, you have to really test these days, real production data um, and, and see if your workloads are really going to come up. Um, how do we know if it will fail back? Uh, Heisbert, why don't you start with this one? It's going to be a really boring answer again. Is it test again? Test, test it. <laughs> well, it's and and of course and of course, uh, look at the capabilities and features of the product. Um, uh, one of the things that we try to do in our product in our platform is is build in that fail back configuration and automate it so that you don't have to think about it. On on the other hand, think about okay, can I fail back? Is there something to fail back to? Um, because if we're if we're willing really talking about a real real disaster scenario, there might nothing, but there might not be anything to fill back to. So so think about that scenario as well. And I think that, that, that when you start looking into DR and when you start looking into a product to use for DR, really focus on the fill back piece. Anyone can fill over. Fill back is is hard. Um, so so look at the capabilities. And again, boring, but test it. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Um, Curtis, you want to chime in on that? Yeah, sure. I, I uh, again agreed there. Uh, I would add that um, just sort of since you, you know we agree that the environment that you would fail back to might not be available for a while, you need to make sure that the the DR scenario wh wherever you're recovering to is going to be okay with a long term run right so you know this isn't this isn't a couple hours or maybe even a day uh, i'm currently sitting in the middle of where they're shutting all the power off for a week of time in northern california and um you know so make sure that you're going to be that you can last for a long time wherever it is that you're going to recover and then agree that fail back is hard for a long list of reasons and one of them is you might have to fail back that you might have to do an entire Know, net new synchronization of data back from wherever your disaster recovery area is uh, back to your, uh, on, you know, wherever your on-prem or cloud environment. And then the other thing that just came to mind is make sure that when you do fail over, that protection is built into the the DR system, right? So, so once you fail over, you're now creating data. Make sure that that new data is being created so that when you fail back, you don't lose everything. Yeah, that's a great point. So you fail over, but do you have any sort of data protection for the data that's running in the the secondary data center? That's a lot of uh, something that a lot of companies don't think about. I, I think they just anticipate maybe running 
we'll just run for a day and then hopefully things will be back up, but that doesn't always happen. And then I guess, I mean, I've heard stories of companies that failed over to the cloud and then just didn't know how to get back on premises and and that's how they moved to the cloud. <laughs> um, yeah, we, I know we've had it. We've had a few that have failed over to the cloud and then they're like, oh, this is not so bad. Maybe, maybe we'll stay. It wasn't that they couldn't figure out how to get back. They just, they were like, hey, this, this isn't so bad. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, Adam, how do you know if it will fail back? I think that on top of, on top of some great points, the capabilities of the product, um, certainly testing, um, your choice of a, of a site is going to affect some of those capabilities. And are you leveraging a, a co-location, a public cloud, or a, a service provider's cloud? At, uh, at Unitrends, we do offer a white glove VR as a service. Uh, we will run customers' infrastructure in our environment and then assist them with reverse feeding the data back down, syncing up with those changes. So I think importantly, you know, testing, but also determining what's the right uh, fit or location for that failover operation for your environment and what are some of the capabilities or the support that you may receive from vendors or service providers in, in getting there and also getting back out. Okay. Yeah, and certainly, I, I guess that's something to look at in any product is, uh, you know, not just does it support failover, it should, but, you know, hey, how is it going to fail back? That's a good question to ask any uh, data protection company out there. I mean, I know there was um, in there was a VMware product from long ago that just there was no failback option. Sorry, that's not supported. <laughs> um, I think that's been fixed since, since uh, that time. But, yeah, so got to make sure that it fails back. The data is protected and while you're there. And I thought this was a unique question because I went through this at one point. Where do I store my DR plan? Any suggestions, uh, Curtis? Well, you know, I, this is going to fall into the to a hammer. Everything looks like a nail, but I, I think the answer is cloud, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, the the and and you know, if you want to use multiple clouds, uh, I, I would say it, it's definitely not in a notebook on your desk, right? It's it's just as important. Without the directions, you're completely, you know, out of luck, right? So make sure that those, that your plan, your uh, your run book, all of that stuff is stored in some alternate location. It's not in the location where, you know, that you're protecting, right? That, that this, this actually seems, I think, the answer of, of the easiest question we've had so far yeah yeah definitely but something that not everybody i i guess uh think would think of perhaps so um i know we got a lot of questions so let's keep moving unless you guys want to chime in on that one um i, I know where not to store it <laughs> that's what i've learned <laughs> uh, we used to store it in a binder on top of the servers in the rack um File server. What, on a server yeah um so this is an interesting one. Um, Heisberg, you want to start with this? How do we simplify DR? Great question. Um, th there, there's, there's multiple ways. I think, I think when we when we look at DR, we, we want to make sure that we, we simplify not only DR, we want to simplify everything in IT. I think one of the, the main goals that, that, and one of the main things people are doing right now is consolidating the tools looking at consolidating some of the data protection tools that they have right now. They might have storage replication from three different vendors. They, they might have uh, orchestration on top of that. They might have a backup product somewhere else. They might have three backup products. They might do database replication. They have four different database vendors. And, and to really simplify it, you need to get a unified way of doing DR, or at least a unified um, orchestration layer where you can define the workflows that you need for DR. Um, and I think the, the more you look at and the more you try to consolidate the tools of, uh, for data protection, the closer you get to simplifying it for as, I mean, for, for as far as you can get. Okay, so to simplify DR, we simplify the entire environment to begin with, right? Okay, um, Adam, what's your take? We would we would absolutely uh, agree with that. I think that when you look at the potential consolidation of multiple point products, you're you're eliminating a lot of potential kind of low value tasks that day to day tuning and management, the interoperability. 
Um, as Hydra said, a lot of that kind of risk and, and inherent complexity as you've been stitching pieces together, I think looking for um, that unified approach and as well leveraging automation where uh, it can be um, are important steps to, to reduce some of that burden on um, IT and the staff. Yeah. Yeah, simplify the entire environment and that's going to result in simplifying IT. It's amazing. I mean, I think I saw a survey that uh, the average or many companies, a high percentage had four different management products in the data center. And I, I bet there's a survey out there that says companies have multiple <laughs> data protection and, and DR products in the data center, which seems pretty crazy to me. W what do you think, Curtis? The three that I know of. You can, sorry? The average is three, three data protection products per data center. Wow, that's hard to believe. That's gotta complicate DR and, and recovery. Um, we got a lot of questions here, so I guess let's just keep keep moving on. We're moving on now from best practices to costs. Uh, Curtis, are costs coming down when it comes to DR? I'm going to say an absolute yes to this question because back in the day, the only way to do this was to either have your own physical, uh, locate, you know, your a physical separate data center or rent a co-location data center or use. A uh, you know an entire service provider that would do all of this, and you would you would have dedicated hardware that you would pay for that would go unused most of the time. With the cloud, uh, if you're leveraging the cloud, if you're able to do that, I think that DR costs come down an order of magnitude or more. Because what you're if, you know if you're doing this, I would say if you're doing this right, the only co the only ongoing costs you're having are the are the storage costs of having your storage ready to go in a format that allows uh, the data to, 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 to come up, e you know, servers to come up easily. So like in the case of doing it in AWS, you're, you're, you're keeping these as uh, AMI uh, format, right? So that you can easily boot those up. And uh, then all of the extra costs, which is the, you know, the, uh, the, the compute costs and the network costs and all of that stuff. In the new world, you don't pay for those costs until you actually test or declare a disaster. So I don't know how much less expensive it can get than that. So yeah, I'm gonna say yes. Yeah, I know, I mean, when I was an IT manager, it was all hardware. You know, if you wanted to do DR, you had to buy uh, identical SANs and buy the, uh, you know, synchronous data replication license. And uh, it was just crazy expensive. And so I'm, I love all these new technologies that are just DR as a service. You pay for it as you need it. Uh, and if you don't need it, then you're not going to pay very much uh, to to have it there. And hopefully you never need it. Um, Adam, what's your take? Are, are costs coming down? I would I would agree with a lot of what Curtis said. And I also think that the, the options for, for customers to consume this are, are varied. As he had mentioned, you can leverage public clouds, uh, purpose-built cloud providers that are provided through a manufacturer, uh, managed service providers as well. There are a lot of different ways to consume and potentially even drive uh, some of the DR through an OpEx versus a CapEx model. Um, as Curtis had mentioned, you know, the elimination of the traditional data center or that secondary co-location um, and the cost associated with it. I think that with some of the ways that, to, that we can consume it now or, or have it packaged and delivered um, has resulted in, in some greater efficiency and driving overall the cost for the organization down, potentially some other ways in which they can build that um, as well, where we've seen you know, in general um, shrinking CapEx budgets as folks are being driven more towards application development and application availability, uh, less investment, I think in some cases in uh, traditional physical hardware. Yeah, yeah, okay, I like that. I mean, as an IT person, I think that's, that's fantastic. Um, let's move on, uh, more DR cost questions. Uh, Heisbert, uh, Heisbert, how do we justify uh, as IT people to management, you know, why we need this? I guess there's tons of scary stats. Um, we could go in and pull the plug one day and just say, see, this stuff was really important. Look, look what happens when it goes down. Uh, but that's probably not a good thing for your career. Uh, any suggestions? I think it's uh, actually it gets back to probably, oh, was it the first question we, we talked about how to start a plan? It's, it's getting insight into what the actual costs are of downtime. What does it cost the business? And I think that actually one-on-one -on -one 
should justify exactly how much you can spend. And, and, and pro it's probably going to be a lot more than it's going to cost. <laughs> um, because the, the, the cost of downtime is really, really high, especially in, in the organizations right now. We're living in a, in a 24 seven world. And, and I know we've been talking about 24 seven for years now. And it used to be, oh, it has to be up and running 24 seven. Up and running is not all, the only thing anymore. It needs to be performing the same as well 24 seven. So that's, that's another thing that, that came into play. And that, that makes it actually really difficult for backup right now with backup windows and, 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 and the way backups are being taken right now. But I think the only way to justify costs for DR and for, for the right data protection strategy is going to the business and making sure that they know how much it costs when you're not doing it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a great point. I mean, if you're having to do DR, you know, nights and weekends on your own time, then you, you probably don't have uh, uh, executive buy-in and that's really important to get. Um, Adam, any suggestions on this? I think just to, just to kind of piggyback on, on what Heisbert was, was saying, looking at it from a couple of different approaches, certainly what's the impact if the organization cannot transact an online web server or a billing tenant uh, were to go down? Obviously, we're not able to bring revenue into the organization. Um, but when applications or workloads are unavailable, what's the impact as well on uh, the productivity of our employees, uh, depending on the disasters that we are facing and when they're mocking through uh, some of those scenarios, what is the cost? of recovery look like as well. So I think it's, it's taking a look at a couple of different factors as they're building out that case and kind of looking at what does that cost truly represent to the business beyond potentially just the inability to, to transact and drive revenue. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, here's a question that just came in. How do we find out the cost of IT being down? I'm sure you can uh, share, you know, scary numbers from the industry, but Curtis, any suggestion on, you know, for my business, how do I know the cost of my business uh, the problem yeah. is that, that can only come from the business unit themselves, right? So only the business unit can specify how much, you know, how much revenue or whatever it is that they generate per hour and then, uh, or per day or whatever, and then, uh, and then give you that number. You can't make up that number. An industry standard number is completely worthless. Uh, you, you need to get the data from them. Uh, and then I just want to add to the previous answers my new boogeyman is ransomware, right? So how do you justify DR? Look at the millions of dollars that are currently being spent in ransomware uh, ransoms for companies that uh, didn't prepare for this, right? It's easy to say, oh, well, you know, we live in this part of the country, so we don't have hurricanes and we don't have earthquakes and we don't have floods. So we're, we're pretty good to go as far as natural disasters are concerned. But what about ransomware? You look at, you know, you look at like Texas a few weeks ago where 23 uh, cities in Texas were shut down by a single ransomware attack simultaneously. And, you know, if you're, I, I think if you're not currently absolutely terrified about that, then, yeah, I don't, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I saw the city of Atlanta, I think, was shut down for two weeks and um, they broke down all of their expenses and there was a lot of surprising expenses in there, like something like a quarter of a million dollars just on PR consultants to help them kind of repair the, the lost trust, you know, with the, the city. Um, so some scary uh, things going on out there with ransomware. And we're going to talk about that here in just a minute, in fact. Um, but quick question, um, Heisbert, if a SMB didn't have much money, they could just do one thing for DR, what would it be? Um, use the cloud, I think would be my, <laughs> the, the, the standard answer. Like, yeah. like Curtis said before, it's, it's, they have the right TCO model. It's, it's you only pay for storage um, and, and you bring it up when you need to. I think that's the, easiest way to actually start using the cloud. Uh, I think number one was backup to the cloud, backup as a service, things like that. Number two right now is DR as a service. Um, there's there's many options out there. There's local ones. I mean, for example, Zerto has 400 globally cloud service providers that provide a service like that. You can use AWS, you can use Azure. Um, but I think if you wanna do one thing for DR, standardize on a tool. I know one, 
um, and 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 start using the the cloud. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Well, wait. Let's keep it moving here. Let's jump into ransomware because there's some questions coming in on ransomware. We have some questions here. Um, first question: Does the backup tool know if my data is hit with a ransomware attack? Uh, Curtis. It, it, it may or may not, right? Depends on the tool. Uh, I know part, like with our service, part of our service will know part of our service we're working on adding that data. Uh, it, it's usually done by anomaly detection, right? So you're looking for things that, um, you know, think, you know, it's like, it, like, this is an easy one. You know, if you're backing up user data and Curtis normally changes one or two files a day and suddenly Curtis changes a thousand files today, well, that's an easy one. Curtis clearly has ransomware, um, or he, or there's a thousand Curtises, <laughs> right? And the ransomware is much more likely. So if you, if you're able to, they're not going to be able to detect it probably in the way that a, that a an antivirus type tool would detect the ransomware itself. What they can detect is unusual patterns in the data uh, and and how it's changing in the backup or the replication. Okay. Okay, good answer. Um, Adam, here's a question that just came in that's related. You might want to maybe cover this instead or, or the question on the screen, either one. Um, but this person, uh, Sira, is asking, um, is it possible that the backups get infected with ransomware as well? So I'll, I'll answer. Um, I'll answer both. Um, but I would I would agree with Curtis in that we're not going to detect it in the way that a um, antivirus would. But absolutely, pick up on those anomalous changes. Unitrends, for example, uh, establishes baseline patterns of behavior for the clients that we are backing up, looking at things like the entropy, the overall randomness of the data, uh, the density, uh, things like change rates as well. There are a number of characteristics when potential threat conditions are met, it triggers an alert, which proactively or, or will allow you know, users to come in and start to identify you know, what's the source of this. And if it turns out it is infection, um, you know, how do we start to remediate? We quarantine the machine. We start looking through some of those logs to try and identify you know, patient zero, what other clients may be impacted. And then you're working through to understand where do we have you know, clean tested backups or restore points that we can start to rebuild those, those clients from. Um, we have absolutely seen uh, ransomware targeting backups and backup repositories. The, the majority of what we've observed is that they're writing Windows binary, looking for those systems. But a lot of the uh, more aggressive variants are, are lying dormant. I was listening to a, to a security podcast, and before you actually get that red screen of, of doom, uh, the threat actor has been within your network for an average of 90 days. They're starting to extract information that they can then sell on the dark web and then they've extracted enough, they say, okay, it's time to demand our ransom on top of that. Um, but in a lot of cases to avoid detection, they'll attempt to script and disable antivirus encrypt backups. We've uh, seen cases where entire backup repositories have been wiped out, backups have been deleted. Uh, ultimately, they're trying to close any loopholes that you have for recovery. Um, so before I pass it to my colleagues, um, the one thing that I would have added for an SMB and even less on the, the complexity in the cloud piece um, is that especially when we're talking about something like ransomware, if I would recommend one thing or here at Unitrends, if we would recommend one thing, uh, it's to get an air-gapped copy of that data off-site regularly, um, disconnected from the production network and, and store it in a safe alternate location. Yeah, great point. Great point. Get that data off-site. Um, Heisbert, what about ransomware? Does the tool know and... And can the data get infected? It's just like Curtis said, depends a little bit on the tool. Um, we, we offer an extensive analytics component within our platform that allows you to take a lot of the data that we see, and that means changes, compression rates, um, change rates, throughput, uh, the files that have changed, you name it. Uh, and you can actually pull that into like any of the monitoring tools you use right now and, and use the standard anomaly detection on top of that. Besides that, we're also working on getting more in the product itself or in the, the, the analytics component itself so that we can actually alert on it. Um, can it be infected? We've seen cases. I think if you Google uh, um, um, ransomware backup repository, you'll find enough information that it actually happens. So. 
I'd, I'd like to take, take a step back from um, um, looking at the actual backup tool, but also look at the security policies you have in place and make sure that you, all your data protection components are isolated, are using a, a different network, are using maybe a different domain, are not accessible by end user computers and things like that. The more things that come before the backup actually gets, in, uh, gets infected. Um, but then if you, and, and when you look at the NIST framework for cybersecurity, um, a lot of people have the, the, the identify, they have the prevent in place. There's a lot they have in place because security companies, and, and right, rightfully so, have been focusing on it for many, many years. The, the, the key element there that they sometimes miss out on is the recovery piece. Because with, was it 14, uh, ransomware attacks every second globally. Um, it's, it's not a question if, it's, it's probably a question when. And when it hits, you need to be able to recover. And, and uh, recovering your data from 24 hours before it happened is not something you can do. So you really need to look at a solution that really gets you to the closest point in time of where the data was still accessible and unencrypted as well. Maybe in a raw format. So don't don't start up the server because hey, it starts up again. That wonderful ransomware uh, binary starts running again, starts encrypting everything again. So you need to get to the raw data itself um, at closest to that point before it started encryption. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, great points. Uh, all around on ransomware. Uh, another question here, uh, Adam, how do I know that I can recover from ransomware? Test, is that the answer again? <laughs> I, was, I was going to head in that, in that direction to, to test absolutely. And, and at Unitrends, we do have um, some automated sandboxed recovery testing. A part of that component, in addition to testing application data and services, um, is being able to scan drives and folders for malware. So certainly looking at understanding, okay, where are um, we certifying the behavior of those underlying applications and ensuring that we have uh, clean tested recovery points? Okay, uh, Curtis, you, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I, I don't. I don't really have anything other than testing. I did want to throw something on earlier regarding the uh, ransomware, uh, you know, infecting backups, and and I do agree that there's actually been quite a bit of uh, quite a few cases of that out there. What I what I have seen is everyone that I've seen always, and you know, I hate to do this, but it's always a Windows-based backup server with the, the data directly accessible via NFS or something. And then if they're infecting another copy, it's going to be another Windows backup server. I'm not anti-Windows, uh, but it, it is a matter of fact that the bulk of the ransomware attacks are against Windows. And if your operating system of your backup server is the same and it's sitting right next to it, it is just as vulnerable to the ransomware as the system being attacked. And so I agree with Adam on the air gap copy. Uh, one of the ways that you can have, as I make the air gap copy, um, is to not have your, your first or your second copy of it on the same exact operating system that everyone is attacking. I, you know. And, if that makes me anti-Windows, you know, so be it. But again, just stating a matter of fact. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a great point, a great clarification um, that I bet a lot of people don't know about. Um, let's move on. Let's talk about cloud. Um, Heisberg, how much will DR in the cloud cost? This is a question that came in. How do we know uh, if the cloud is, you know, pay based on consumption how do we know what it's going to cost us to to use it and then um, to actually have a disaster and bring systems up? Um, the first thing you you need to know is what what's, what type of solution am I using? So what are the components I'm going to use in the cloud? Um, the other one thing I would recommend and and um, at Zerto we we have a tool that's called Resource Planner. Um, which actually allows you to basically scan or uh, like do an inventory on your environment and show you exactly what are the resources from a DR perspective you need in the cloud. And you can actually fine tune it for different clouds like AWS or Azure. So I think uh, looking at a tool that has the ability to also help you size and 
plan for that. And not only plan for what you have now, but of course also plan for those what if scenarios. Okay, what if I decide to not store 30 days of changes, but seven days of change, things like that. Um, that really helps in, in getting as, um, as accurate in, in estimating what it's gonna cost you from a DR perspective. Yeah, yeah, great points. There's and there's a lot of factors, like you said, there that go into it. Um, Curtis, how do we know the cost of DR in the cloud? Is there a calculator? Yeah, I'd say you know uh, two things. It was it was already mentioned that you know it, it's going to be based on the service that you're using. Uh, some there, there's both the ongoing cost in terms of the actual cost of the system itself to make the disaster recovery happen. And then there's the cost of actually declaring a disaster. The only way you're gonna know the second one, same answer as every other question, which is to test it, right? That's the only, that's the only way you're gonna know it. Kick it off, run it for an hour, uh, and, and then, then calculate that cost, right? And then multiply that time to however long you need to test it. And then the other is, it's going to be incredibly variable based on the system that you uh, employ to do the disaster. And then I would add, if, if we're talking about cloud, and I think most often people are now starting to talk about the cloud, make sure that you include the secondary cloud costs if your solution has them. So things like ingress and egress uh, and, and, and gets and puts and all of those other things you can have of the ongoing costs, make sure that you look at those uh, and you know, obviously, one of the reasons I say it is we bake those into the cost of our plan, where it's it's constant. Whereas uh, with most of the solutions, it's going to be going up and down based on you know your usage. Okay. Okay. Great points, uh, Adam. How much will DR on the cloud cost me? I think that that um, that Heisberg and Curtis made made some great points around the public cloud, and and really whether you're going uh, public cloud to a manufacturer provided cloud or an MSP really understand what's detailed in their service level agreements. What levels of service are they offering? What does that entail? Uh, what's the responsibility of the provider uh, versus you as the subscriber to the service? And I think that Curtis makes a great point around the, tree, uh, the fees of data retrieval and, and how can their technology or their solution or the way that they're packaging it uh, reduce some of that burden to provide a fixed cost to the customer. Uh, similarly, at Unitrends, we do have a proprietary cloud environment that can be used for DR as a service. Uh, and it's on a, a per instance basis. So we're looking at, you know, what is the RTO SLA requirement? Uh, what are the required resources for particular machines or instances to run on the cloud? Uh, and then providing them with a, with a contract that says, okay, this is the, the RTO that we're providing. We'll orchestrate that failover process, help you reroute connections and, and get your traffic rerouted to our cloud stack. Uh, and ultimately, what, what's the cost of that look like? And, and how much do you need as well? Um, how many instances, uh, are they the right type, in what region? Um, looking at some of those pieces as well will kind of help calculate it, but I think there are a few different ways in which you can go, depending again on what that cloud solution looks like. Is it public cloud? Is it being facilitated through a, a vendor, a manufacturer, or an MSP? And kind of what are their contracts or their agreements entail there? Okay, okay, good info. I know we're, we're running out of time here. Let's see if we can move to the lightning round. Um, in fact, Best. we might just have to get, I think, to this last question because we just have a, a minute or so left. Um, how do I get started? Uh, so Zerto, uh, Heisbert, why don't you start talking about Zerto uh, for a minute here? How do we get started with Zerto if that's the product we want to test? www.zerto.com <laughs> and get a trial. Okay. Uh, it's uh, that, that's the that's the easiest way to do it. Um, um, go to YouTube. There's many demo videos. We have some great videos around how to recover or how we help recover you from ransomware. Um, and uh, I think, like we said before, test, test, test. Uh, we make it really easy to test. Completely non-disruptive. It's software only. Have a try. Okay. Nice. Uh, Curtis, how do we get started with Druva? Yeah, so ours is a uh, service only. So um, it's super easy to do uh, a POC of our uh, service. So basically it's just a, so druva.com obviously is where you start. And uh, literally if you're talking to one of our salespeople on the phone, they you can be doing a demo of our entire product suite by the time you hang up with them, right? Because there's nothing to install other than the agent that's going to be uh, where you're gonna be protecting the data. 
because you don't have to worry with the uh, the back end infrastructure. We we take care of all of that. Awesome, awesome. And Adam, how do we get started with Unitrends? Uh, similarly, as well, uh, Unitrends.com is a is a great place. Um, a lot of online um, videos, demonstrations of the product, some great resources, case studies. Um, we offer full feature trials as well of our software that you can download directly from our website. Um, we'll help you walk through and get that stood up and installed. Um, our hardware appliances, you can POC as well. So, so feel free to reach out, unitrends.com backslash contact. Um, our toll-free uh, sales line can submit form information or uh, just jump right in and download the trial, start to play around with it for yourself and see if it might be um, a solution that would meet uh, the needs of your organization. Awesome, awesome. Well, I mean, uh, tons of companies out there are really struggling with data protection and disaster recovery, especially with ransomware we talked about today. They're struggling uh, with testing even, and I'm excited that you all have some really innovative solutions that, that are going to help these companies out there uh, and IT organizations that I, I feel you know dramatically need help with disaster recovery and data protection. So thank you so much for sharing your stories, uh, customer stories, uh, examples, real world experience. Uh, really appreciate that. Before we go, I want to make sure that I award our three prize winners their $100 Amazon gift cards. Those are going to Richard Johnston of Washington, Paul McFarland of Illinois, and Chad Matsuno of Hawaii. Congratulations to all of you. Uh, we'll reach out to deliver your gift cards. I, I also want to remind everyone to download the, the uh, four handouts that are available right there in the audience console. There's a lot of great additional resources on how you can use uh, Unitrends, Druva, and Zerto to protect your data and protect your company. Thank you, Curtis. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Heisbert, for being on the event today. Thank you. Bye -bye. Absolutely. David, thank you so much for having us. Thanks, guys. And thank you to our audience for joining us on the event today. And of course, thank you to our sponsors. Uh, please visit Druva, Zerto, and Unitrans. Check out the solutions and give them a try for yourself. Have a great day, and we'll see you next time.